So, um, dear Professor Mitsuo Kanato, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce your talk. Uh, just summarize a few words about your biography and the main lines of your research. So, you, you got a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Tokyo University in 1976, a Master of Engineering and a PhD degree in biophysics engineering from Osaka University in 1978 and 1981, respectively. So from 1981 to 1988, you were a faculty member and a lecturer at uh, Osaka University. And from 1988, you were a senior researcher and then a supervisor at the ATA Auditory and Visual Perception Research Laboratories. Since 2003, you have been director of the ATR Computational Neuroscience Laboratories and also an ATR fellow since 2004. You are now, since 2010, the director of uh, ATR Brain Information Communication Research Laboratories. You have been involved in very um, strong projects, ERATO and ICORP, that has given rise to great transfer from neuroscience to robotics. And in 2008, you were jointly appointed as a research supervisor of the Presto project with the GST. So Professor Mitsuo Kawato, uh, you, got, you received many awards from different prestigious scholarship societies and governmental institutions. Let me take a few words about uh, your work. You are one of the pioneers trying to draw the link between neuroscience and robotics, and you great uh, major achievements in this direction. So I have, if I have to summarize your action in one sentence, I would say that you want to understand the brain by creating the brain. And as you know that a brain by itself is nothing, that it has to be connected to sensors and actuators and be in a real body, then you were interested in humanoid robots. And uh, you consider that you are humanoid robots are a tool for uh, understanding no neuroscience. As you say, you aim at understanding the brain to the extent that you can make humanoid robots solve tasks typically solved by the human brains by using essentially the same principles. So your research work in neuroscience has led to identify some of the key principles in neuroscience that you were able to transfer to your human neutral robots. So today your talk uh, will be about what you call manipulative neuroscience, a new approach, and the control of brain, robot, and world. So please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Philip Soares. Uh, it's my great honor to give a talk in Calais de France, and I would like to thank very much uh, Professor Raymond. And uh, as a self-introduction, I would like to show you quite old movie, which is already 10 years old. But uh, it's good to show some of my colleagues when they were still young. Stefan Shaw. They run the Kawaito Dynamic Brain Project at the research center near Kyoto, Japan. Their star pupil, a robot named DB, short for Dynamic Brain. They've designed a brain program for DB that allows him to learn motor skills. Hiroshibata. Instead, he observes with his video camera eyes and then tries and tries to mimic behavior until he gets it right. With robot can imitate a human motor 
skills or human motor tasks. That is uh, fascinating because we do not need to uh, write programs by ourselves. Robot can learn by himself by imitation. Okay, we've got a robot smart enough to ape our movements. Way cool. So I started my new science 35 years ago, and I started to use a uh, industrial robot, our uh, Puma 260, and Bridgestone soft one with uh, pneumatic actuators around uh, 30 years ago. But uh, I came into uh, humanoid robots because uh, I had uh, many international collaborators. I met uh, Chris Atkinson at MIT in 1987, and with him and uh, with uh, Andy Bauto, I visited Sarkos Research Company in Utah. And uh, Stefan Schall stayed for three months and worked, worked, worked with Hiroaki Gomi in 1993. Then we started uh, JST, Elato Dynamic Brain Project, uh, from 1996 to 2001. Stefan Schall, Kenji Doya, Hiroshi Mamizu are three group leaders, and Alesh Ude was also a very important part of the vision of this project. I, I'm quite proud that uh, Stefan Schall is now jointly appointed as a director of Max Planck Institute and the University of Southern California. Kenji Doya is now uh, vice provost of Okinawa uh, Science and Technology Institute, and Hiroshi Mamizu is a director of ATR Cognitive Mechanism Laboratory. Uh, you can see names like uh, uh, Aoke, Aude, and Setsu, and Jan Peters, who were all graduate students at that time, but now they are professors, uh, Swiss and uh, Scottish and uh, German universities. And then uh, from 2002 to 2009, we had uh, JST ICOP uh, project called Computational Brain Project. So we had two chairs uh, for this. One is American chair, Chris Atkinson, the other is myself. And uh, Professor Gordon Chen, who is now uh, University of uh, Munich a professor, uh, Technical University Munich a professor, was uh, uh, manager of this, and uh, Morimoto Nakanishi and many others were uh, working with us. And from 2008 to 2019, we have uh, mixed uh, SRPBS Brain Machine Interface project. So these three projects are kind of integrating neuroscience and uh, robotics uh, in the territory. And uh, my talk uh, consists of four parts, computational neuroscience, brain machine interface, and manipulation of neural cores, and finally, network brain machine interface uh, project. So in response uh, to the question uh, raised by uh, Professor Raymond, whether robotics is uh, engineering or science, I'm a computational neuroscience uh, researcher, so from my point of view, I will define a neuroscience and robotics as follows. So, the catchphrase of our study is, as uh, uh, Dr. Philip uh, Sarres uh, mentioned, understanding the brain by creating the brain. The motivation of this is as follows. And robots and computers are much inferior to humans in many uh, daily functions. And this demonstrates that we do not fully understand brain functions. Although neuroscience, brain science have been working hard for 50 years, and I believe that only if we try to create a brain, we can understand information processing in the brain. And but creating only a brain and uh, make it float in a flasco does not make sense to study uh, visual information processing or motor control. So we definitely need a body and its environment. And for me, it's robot, humanoid robot. And my definition of computational neuroscience is we elucidate information processing of the brain to the extent that artificial machines, either computer programs or robots, can build to solve the same computational problems that are solved by the brain, essentially in the same principle. And this is very lengthy definition, but if you take out this uh, rust phrase, essentially in the same principle, and just say, Either computer programs or robots can be built to solve the same computational problems that are solved by the brain. 
Then from my point of view, this is definition of artificial intelligence and robotics, where if your algorithm or solution are much more superior to humans, if it's less costly, if it's uh, more powerful, or it's you know, faster, you do not care uh, to stick to original uh, brain algorithms. For example, in the case of biped locomotion, uh, you know, ZMP, zero moment point uh, control method has been widely used uh, for biped uh, locomotion. But uh, from neuroscience point of view, we know that uh, for humans, even for humans, we have so-called uh, central pattern generator for rhythmic movement, which is different from uh, neural networks for discrete movements. And we could utilize uh, that kind of idea uh, for uh, biped locomotion of a robot, which may look much fuller than ZMP, but uh, from computational point of view, this is the algorithm which we are interested in. Uh, this is a robot uh, developed by Chris Atkinson at CMU with uh, some collaborators. And we used uh, central pattern generators uh, which are reset when the foot touches the ground. As you can see, with this shape of the foot, it uh, touches the ground only one point. So usual ZMP doesn't work for this. And uh, it's a quite a toy uh, biped robot but it can deal with different frictions, different slopes, but because uh, its uh, motors are not so powerful, it cannot climb up uh, too steep slopes, as you can see. And uh, reset of central pattern generators are really important, and if you turn off this uh, resetting mechanism, then it cannot continue to work. So from my point of view, this is computational neuroscience, and Ashimo working is engineering robotics. And if you take all these uh, phrases, and you, if you just say we elucidate information processing of the brain, this is the definition of neuroscience. But unfortunately, most of uh, modern neuroscience is molecular, cellular neurobiology which chops brain into you know, different parts and uh, make slices, stick electrons into uh, neurons. But it can dearly discuss about information processing of the brain. So that's the reason uh, I believe we need to have this rather lengthy definition of computational neuroscience. We elucidate information processing of the brain to the extent that artificial machines, either computer programs or robots can be built to solve the same computational problems that are solved by the brain, essentially in the same principle. So for this purpose, uh, we've been developing uh, different uh, human robots, especially in collaboration with uh, uh, Sarkos Research Company, uh, Stefan Shaw, and Chris Atkinson. This is the latest robot uh, with a human size. And the most striking uh, aspect of this robot is we use hydraulic actuators, so we do not have any reduction gears. So each joint can be compliant by its uh, mechanics. It has many, many different uh, sensors, and it carries uh, sensory motor control computers on its back. And perception and learning can be done with PC cluster uh, with wireless uh, connection. So let me uh, show a few uh, example, demonstration examples of this uh, human robot. This is uh, Sang Ho Hyung, who is uh, a main person uh, for this uh, posture control project under uh, Gordon Chen in our ICO project. So this robot can balance on um, unpredictable incline, and also it can balance with one foot on unknown and unstable uh, object, actually a wood rod. And probably he is better than I regarding this uh, posture control. So this was done by combination of uh, usual uh, gravity compensation and uh, internal model, which uh, somehow approximates uh, this whole body as an inverted pendulum plus uh, viscoelastic uh, property at each joint. 
And uh, Alesh Ude, who has been always a main uh, researcher of uh, vision information processing in our uh, Elato and ICO project, has been working to integrate motor control capability and uh, uh, peripheral and uh, uh, central vision of this uh, humanoid robot. So now uh, he and uh, his colleagues uh, can succeed for robots to search some interesting object on the desk and then grab it and uh, look it with different uh, postures and can make a three-dimensional uh, model of uh, object. And then by combining a support vector machine with uh, wavelet uh, Gabo filters to have something like 95%, uh, 97% accuracy of uh, discriminating 16, 20 different uh, objects. And here, uh, our posture control, head movement, eye movement are all necessary to somehow focus on the robot uh, while utilizing high accuracy uh, central vision. Now, I'd like to go into our uh, neuroscience, wet neuroscience part. So I make a distinction between robotics and the computational neuroscience, but actually these two are so tightly coupled, especially in the bi-directional sense. If you come up with some new ideas in robotics, this can be tested in wet neuroscience, whether that kind of algorithm really work in the brain. And if in neuroscience you can come up with very effective uh, algorithm, you can probably uh, apply this to a uh, robotics field. For example, uh, for me, reinforcement learning of Andy Bauto and Rich Sutton is a latter case. I will talk about the former case. So we came up with the idea of cerebellar internal model theory. Uh, we postulated that the cerebellum, small brain here, consists of many modules which perform different input-output transformations, and synaptic weights uh, can change and different transformation can be learned. And supervised learning is uh, guided by an error signal, and different modules acquire internal models of controlled objects, tools, other brains, and so on. And we proposed this uh, theory around 1980s. At that time, already in robotics, uh, internal model ideas are quite uh, widespread. And Stefan Schall and his uh, collaborators uh, tested uh, this idea utilizing our uh, DB, dynamic plane humanoid robot. Here, DB is balancing a pole after watching uh, Stefan Schaas balancing this pole. So uh, just by utilizing a color-based vision, uh, the robot has already uh, acquired an internal forward model of the lot. That is uh, predicting the lot movement from acceleration at the tip, lower tip of this uh, pole. So we applied the developed statistical learning method to various tasks in order to verify its effectiveness. Visual motor learning is one possible task. In this task, the robot should keep tracking a ball with its hand, which requires the learning of self-dynamics information, as well as coordination between the target and the hand. After the robot finishes learning the task, if we put a weight in the robot's hand, the robot can no longer track the ball. However, it continues to learn its new dynamics, and finally recovers and achieves good visual motor coordination. The robot can update its internal model when it encounters a change in the model. So the cerebellum has a very beautiful neural circuitry. And uh, the only output neuron of the cerebellar cortex is called Parkinger cells. And it receives uh, two uh, major different kinds of excitatory input. One is climbing fiber input. Only one axon have multiple synapses on one Parkinger cell. Others are parallel fibers. Hundreds of thousand parallel fibers make a numerous number of synapses on this uh, uh, dendritic uh, branch. And David Marr, James Albas, and Professor Masao Ito propose that uh, probably climbing fibers are teaching signal or error signal. And 
synaptic efficacy from prior fiber to Parkinji cell are adjusted in so-called long-term depletion, long-term potentiation when uh, climbing fiber uh, input is activated or not activated. And this was uh, physiologically demonstrated, but uh, we didn't have computational theory. What kind of computation uh, this neural circuit is actually doing? So that's the reason why we propose maybe with this uh, cerebellar learning internal models were uh, acquired. But uh, showing some robot, successful robot demonstration based on cerebellar internal model is not a biological uh, solution to this question. So we uh, collaborated with monkey neurophysiologists and uh, we asked them to uh, record from a single Parkinger cell of a monkey while a monkey is doing some eye movement called ocular following responses. By changing the uh, speed and durations of uh, 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 visual stimuli, we could uh, obtain very different uh, temporal waveforms of single Parkinger cell firing pattern. And this can be well explained by a simple inverse dynamics model of the eye movement. This is monkey study. And for humans, uh, we used uh, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, while our human subjects are learning to manipulate new tool. Then at the beginning, uh, we see uh, big, big uh, uh, activations in the uh, bilateral part of the new cerebellum. But at the end, uh, we observe only a small portion of the cerebellum uh, is activated. And the time courses and the spatial patterns of this activation are in good accordance of the predictions of our theory that uh, human cerebellum acquires internal models of uh, tools. And recently, uh, we started to th uh, think about more about uh, uh, neural circuit of the uh, Parkinger cell and uh, cerebellar deep nucleus and uh, okay. cerebral nucleus and oh somehow happened and the figure has gone oh. <laughs> So anyway, uh, we still continue uh, to develop our computational model of uh, cellular learning. And within the cellular cortex, uh, we have Parkinger cell and deep cellular nucleus and inferior olive uh, triangle neural circuit, which is, of course, closed. And uh, there have been some uh, uh, theoretical uh, proposal why we have this uh, triangle circuit. But uh, we came up with the idea that maybe uh, this uh, circuit is good for controlling the degree of freedom of the learning system. And uh, did uh, simulation as well as some, uh, Yes, so uh, Parkinger cell inhibits uh, cerebellar deep nucleus, and cerebellar deep nucleus inhibits gap junctions made uh, between uh, neighboring inferior olive neurons, and inferior olive neurons uh, innervate uh, Parkinger cell with very strong excitatory inputs, and this is uh, hypothesized as uh, error signals. At the beginning of learning, because uh, Parkinger cell fires very strongly, uh, cellular deep nucleus is inhibited, so uh, electrical junctions uh, is effectively very strong. So many inferior olive neurons tend to uh, fire synchronously. That means the uh, degree of freedom of this uh, nervous system is relatively low, which is good for fast and rough uh, learning at the beginning of uh, learning. But in the late stage of learning, because Parkinger cells are not so much excited, uh, deep cerebellar nucleus are more excited, and you have uh, inhibitory synapses very active here. And then you have leak current or shunting inhibition between these electrical synapses. So each uh, individual inferior olive neuron can fire individually. So you have many degrees of freedom 
which is slow in learning, but uh, which can deal with very uh, finite uh, uh, learning uh, functions. Now, I'd like to change a gear and uh, would like to explain our more recent study on brain machine interface. So in Japan, uh, from 2008, we started the brain machine interface project as ATL as a core uh, research and uh, institute. And we include uh, many different uh, uh, universities and the company, including some uh, clinical uh, medical doctors. Uh, for example, this is uh, one of the success story uh, using so-called ecology electro, electro, electrocortical gram electrolyte. So this is uh, usual EEG electrodes, but these electrodes are directly put on the cerebral cortical surface. So it needs a surgical operation, but because it does not directly uh, damage uh, cerebral cortex, we call this uh, least uh, invasive method, not invasive method. And with this method, once you determine uh, so-called decoding parameters from ECOG, uh, to uh, control of uh, robotic uh, prosthesis, it is really uh, stable. So electrodes are very uh, durable, which is in sharp contrast to stick electrodes, invasive electrodes. Okay. But uh, with this subject, we still have wires uh, sticking from the subject, which is not bad which is bad, uh, of course, for infections and uh, you know, daily usages. So we've been developing a totally embedded electrocortical gland BMI system, uh, which uh, consists of three-dimensional high-density ECOG electrodes, some of which can be put into sulcus. And uh, artificial uh, skull bone uh, casing, which contains this kind of uh, 100 28 channel amplifier and AD converter. And uh, within abdomen, uh, we have this uh, fluorine polymer abdomen casing for non contact battery charging and wireless. And this was developed for human subject, but uh, last year we succeeded to put it into Japanese macaque monkey. And uh, we uh, succeeded in continuous ECOG recordings uh, in monkey over several days. So this kind of uh, you know, continuous long-time brain measurement uh, should be very beneficial, not only for BMI application, but also to detect some brain event, which occurs only once in a lifetime, like, you know, creativity, aha experience, and so on. And the other successful application of uh, uh, BMI is BMI-based uh, neurofeedback and uh, neurorehabilitation because uh, Japan became very elderly society. Uh, there is uh, quite a depressive uh, a prediction that within 30 years, maybe one third of Japanese people need to support two third of old people. And uh, also, uh, we have uh, Western diet, which is uh, a lot of energy and fat. We have now three million uh, stroke patients in Japan and about one, one million uh, needs to have uh, rehabilitation. And uh, you, you know that most of uh, hemiparetic uh, stroke patients have this kind of uh, very flexed posture. Then the hemiparetic hand cannot be used for grasping things. Then it's a useless hand and useless arm. So it's really important for them to extend their wrist and to extend finger. Then they can grasp something. But with the current uh, rehabilitation protocol, only 15% of 1 million uh, stroke patients can uh, recover a useful hand. So we used a uh, uh, usual EEG decoding system with a robotic uh, sprint to circumvent uh, this difficulty. Uh, we measured a uh, sensory motor cortex EEG Lism called mulism, a uh, ten health lism. And uh, in healthy subject, when we make mental motor imagery or, or prepare voluntary movement, we could uh, uh, observe a decrease of mulism power called uh, event related desynchronization of mulism. And uh, 
uh, paralytic uh, patients after uh, 10 or 15 years stroke occurrence, uh, they cannot uh, first uh, even do mental motor imagery. But after repeated uh, BMI training, uh, they could uh, increase, uh, decrease uh, mutism power associated with uh, this kind of sign. Then if a successful mental motor imagery occurs, we a little bit extend uh, their uh, list and finger. With this uh, new feedback, uh, surprisingly, more than half of the very uh, severe uh, hemiparatic stroke patients can recover uh, event-related desynchronization of their EEG and reappearance of EMG in the extensor of the wrist. And this lady, uh, who is 66 years old, couldn't uh, use uh, her uh, paralyzed uh, hand at all before this BMI rehabilitation. But uh, now she can grasp a small thing and can move it. So now her hand is uh, useful. And this is uh, enormously helpful for improvement uh, of her quality of life. Now she can, for example, open a you know, uh, toothpaste tube and dip a sugar package and so on and so on. And and we have already, uh, KO University people have already uh, applied this method for 40 patients. And now we, uh, they are now in the RCT randomized uh, control trials uh, uh, to uh, further uh, prove the effectiveness of this method. In ATL, uh, in close collaboration with uh, KO University uh, rehabilitation uh, people, we've been developing exoskeleton robot for rehabilitation. So as you have already seen, we have some uh, technology for very stable posture control. So severe whole body uh, stroke patients cannot stand, cannot sit, cannot walk. So for those people, we would like to balance their body and support their whole body. So uh, for this purpose, we uh, developed a hybrid actuators composed of air muscles and electrical motors. And uh, this can balance, for example, a 40 kilogram um, mannequin, which cannot, of course, uh, stand by himself. And then uh, with this uh, exoskeleton, uh, we utilized EEG control of exoskeleton. So, uh, Noda-san, uh, who is a main uh, researcher of this project, is trying to somehow uh, generate alpha rhythm of EEG. Then gravity compensation of this robot is uh, turned on. And during this locomotion, uh, utilizing uh, EEG and EMG, the robot system can predict the future locomotion uh, pattern of this uh, uh, healthy subject in this case. And it is generating not only gravity compensation, but also uh, some uh, inertia force, uh, which is necessary for uh, biped locomotion. And uh, Shimazu company in Kyoto has been developing new near infrared spectroscopy combined with EEG, high end and wearable systems. So if you uh, combine NEWS and EEG, NEWS is good for spatial resolution, and EEG is good for uh, temporal resolution. So by utilizing so-called uh, uh, inverse problem uh, solution, we could have very high spatial temporal resolution, even with this kind of portable system. And then uh, for the specific purpose of BMI-based uh, neural rehabilitation, uh, they also developed a very simple system with only four probes of NEWS and six channels of EEG, which can be used at home by stroke patients with wireless. And we used a previous uh, type of this uh, NEWS EEG combined system in collaboration with Honda and uh, Shimazu in 2008 to control Ashimaru robot.
If air conditioning automatically came on when you think the room is too warm without needing to use a remote control. If the trunk and doors of your car open when you think about opening them as you approach the vehicle with both hands full carrying things. And if robots can help you when you think about multitasking around the house. The technology to control machines by human fall alone is called Brain Machine Interface or BMI. And researchers around the world are actively conducting research on this technology. In May 2006, Honda and ATR successfully developed a BMI technology which utilizes a functional MRI scanner and achieved the first success in the world to control a robot at speeds close to real time by decoding brain activity without electrode array implants in the brain or the special training of the user. We succeeded in capturing the slight changes in the human brain that occur while a person moves a hand, sending out commands for the robot hand to make the same movement as the person. This is new CEG system, but which is not the latest. The number of channels is about quarter compared with the latest uh, top-end system. Now, I would like to go into the third part, manipulation of neural codes. I talked to you that uh, robotics and neuroscience are bidirectionally, uh, mutually very beneficial. Uh, from neuroscience, uh, you might find some good ideas. And uh, uh, for neuroscience, uh, some uh, theoretical uh, proposals can be learned or you know, borrowed uh, from robotics. Likewise, in brain machine interface, uh, robotics and neuroscience are integrated for application, but it turned out that this combination of robotics and neuroscience give us very, very powerful and innovative tools, which was entirely impossible in the past uh, neuroscience. That's a manipulation of neural codes. So uh, previous system neuroscience is a correlational study. So uh, Francis Crick and uh, Christoph Koch uh, propose a uh, uh, research paradigm, neural correlates of consciousness. That means you are searching for correlates, not the causes of consciousness. But if you look into molecular biology or most of the hard science, we have experimental tools to manipulate causes of some events. In neuroscience, you have region study or electrical estimation, but they are not able to 
manipulate neural cores in the brain. So we severely lack the most important technical uh, tools in system neuroscience. No special temporal control of cores based on recording has been done. So we did this in computational neuroscience while utilizing a BMI technique. Uh, we first applied this to perceptual learning uh, problem, perceptual learning inceptive by decoded fMRI new feedback without visual stimulus presentation. Shibata, Watanabe, Sasaki are colleagues on this project. So visual perceptual learning is uh, learning in the visual system. Uh, for example, you know, very uh, skillful uh, radiologists can easily find cancers from images, but it's impossible for usual human uh, people. And uh, this uh, capability was not uh, uh, genetic. Uh, he learned or she learned uh, this uh, visual uh, perceptual uh, capability by many, many experiences. In psychology, this visual perceptual learning was uh, very widely studied, and uh, we could find this learning effect in uh, GABO orientation, uh, discrimination, or Barney acuity, or contour detection, or motion from random dot motion. And for example, in the case of contrast detection, it's so easy to find contrast here, but it should be quite difficult here, right? If we plot uh, the percent correct of detecting the contrast as a function of the contrast intensity, you have this uh, S-shaped curve, sigmoid curve called psychometric function or psychophysics function. And after repeated exposure to this kind of uh, stimuli, you have uh, improved uh, psychometric function. So after training uh, for the same contrast, you have better accuracy of detecting this contrast. And regarding the neural locus of this visual perceptual learning, there have been severe uh, controversy and disputes. Someone say it's a primary visual cortex V4, MT, and even decision-making area like LIP, or some other people say it's the synaptic weights between GZ area and GZ areas. One of the reasons of this dispute is that the previous neuroscience study is just correlational. So what you uh, usually ask is to ask your human subject or a monkey subject to learn some uh, visual perceptual learning paradigm and their performance improved. And then you do fMRI or stick electrode in some hypothetical brain lesion and say you observe uh, more activity or the receptive field properties of these neurons change. But there's no guarantee uh, this is a locus of uh, visual perceptual learning. This might be just epiphenomena. Maybe in some other areas, uh, visual perceptual learning takes place. And uh, this is, uh, you know, a uh, broad change as an epiphenomena for this. So this is a weakness of conventional correlational approach. What you really would like to do is to cause uh, some specific neural codes in specific brain area and to induce are some behavioral change, cognition, visual perceptual line. This is cause and effect way of proving uh, the locus. And this new approach for causal uh, study is called by us decoded fMRI neurofeedback, in which we take some target area, we utilize a machine learning decoder to uh, extract information. And we use uh, neural feedback, either with reward or some electrical stimulation or some kind of feedback. And to uh, stably uh, induce specific desired pattern, regulate neural activation pattern only in a primary visual cortex and secondary visual cortex through operant conditioning, utilizing decoder and real-time fMRI feedback. So uh, the experiment uh, consists of uh, four steps, behavioral pretest and behavioral post-test. And during that, uh, we do uh, fMRI decoder construction and uh, decoded fMRI neural feedback. The task is to uh, discriminate three orientations, 10 degrees orientation, 70 degrees, and 130 degrees. So this divides whole 36 degrees into three. 
and uh, we change the signal to noise ratio. So it's so easy to say that this is 70 degrees, but it should be quite difficult uh, to discriminate that this is a 70 degree orientation. So you could get a psychometric function again for this uh, three orientation force choice uh, discrimination task. And uh, we uh, show uh, these three orientation with different uh, signal to noise ratio for six seconds and ask the subject to report the orientation. And then in the decoder construction stage, we gave uh, these three orientation stimuli to subject and train a decoder uh, called marginal sparse logistic regression decoder, which can tell the probability or likelihood of the orientation uh, for which our subject is watching. For example, from this uh, brain activity pattern, this decoder can say with 61%, uh, it is probable that the subject is watching this 10 degrees orientation, right? This is decoding technique utilizing machine learning algorithm. And this is the most important, the most complicated uh, diagram. That is decoded fMRI new feedback. So our purpose is to induce spatial uh, neural activity within the primary visual cortex and secondary visual cortex without any visual stimulus presentation, without any visual conscious awareness of what's going on. So what we asked our subject is, please manipulate your hind brain to get maximum monetary reward. So during six seconds of induction period, our subject watched only this central fixation spot. And six seconds after that, we gave this uh, visual feedback, a uh, green disk, whose size is proportional to the output of a decoder for a specific target orientation. So we have three orientations. So for each subject, we randomly assigned one of the three orientations. And this decoder consistently uh, reports the, uh, the likelihood or probability of that assigned orientation. For example, for this subject, we assign 10 degrees orientation. So if his V1 and V2 activity are very close to that induced by the actual 10 degree orientation visual stimulus, then this decoder sets 100%. In that case, this disk is in full size, and our subject is lucky, he can get 20 or 30 years. Okay, so within a day, uh, they undergo uh, 160 trials like this. So when we studied this, we thought it's probably impossible without telling any mechanism of this, that all these mechanisms are withdrawn from our subject. And we just say, please manipulate your head. But uh, many of our subjects were successful. And as I said, for each subject, we assigned one of the three orientations as a target direction. Because we have three orientations, uh, the likelihood chance level is 100 divided by three, that is 33%. But from the first day of this training, our subject can generate larger likelihood. That is, their brain activity is closer to what we wanted to induce. And it increased for 10 days. And of course, uh, because the sum of the likelihood is 100%, two other directions, probability decreased. Then, uh, to our big uh, satisfaction, in the direction, uh, which is not the target direction, is a minus 60 degree or plus 60 degree. If you plot it, uh, psychometric function, percent collect as a function of uh, signal to noise ratio, Pre-test and post-test are perfectly overlapped. So there is no learning, no visual perceptual learning at all for these two directions, which were not trained. But on, only for the trained orientation, we have increased accuracy of the subject uh, performance. And as I said, some subjects can well uh, induce their brain activities, and some are not. So when we plotted the likelihood sum for target orientation for each subject, uh, we have here 
I think, 10 subjects. And, and actually, this uh, abscissa is the total amount of money uh, for each uh, subject can earn. And when we plotted uh, D prime, uh, which is uh, index for perceptual uh, learning, we have nice linear curve uh, with very low uh, dangerous probability. So perceptual learning effect was uh, well correlated with neural feedback performance. And moreover, after all the experiment were terminated, we asked the subject, what is your strategy to manipulate your uh, brain and to get higher reward? And all of them reported us superstitious strategies, which has nothing to do with visual mental imagery of uh, orientation. And then we told them as a mechanism of uh, neural feedback and asked uh, which target direction do you believe you are trained? And again, their answer was totally random, target plus 60 and minus 60. So they were not aware at all about what they did for manipulating their brain activity, either implicitly or explicitly. So from this, uh, we could conclude that mere induction of spatial pattern of neural activity is sufficient to cause visual perceptual learning without visual stimulus presentation. And V1, V2 as a locus of visual perceptual learning, at least of this type. And also we demonstrated that V1, V2 plasticity in adulthood. So V1, V2 are known to pass so-called critical period or sensitivity period at the earliest compared with other brain areas. So this is very encouraging for people like me, uh, old people. And subjects were not aware of what the neural feedback signal represents and which is a target orientation. And we also ascertained that uh, minimum information leak outside V1, V2. Although, you know, we control only V1, V2 by decoded neural feedback because V1, V2 are connected to other brain regions, maybe information orientation information leaked out during our induction, but uh, we disproved uh, that kind of possibility by additional experiments. Now, uh, I'd like to compare uh, several techniques of uh, systems neuroscience. And uh, I'd like to emphasize that our new approach is cause and effect from neural cause to mind although previous approach is correlational. For example, in monkey, you stick an electrode and you observe some uh, temporal uh, changes of firing frequency, and it is temporarily correlated to physical and or mental variable which you have in your cell. But this is correlation. Legion study, you destroy some part of the brain and loss or deterioration of functions is found, but this is at best necessary condition. That part of the brain may be necessary for some function, but you do not have any method to control neural codes. In the case of decoding neural feedback, from a restricted brain lesion, you could extract some important information, and you could feedback this information by reward, electrical stimulus, or TMS, whatever. And you could induce a specific neural cause. And this is, you know, from neural cause to mind. It's a cause and effect entirely new approach of system neuroscience. So in 2008, uh, Miguel Nicolais and Gordon Chen and Morimoto-san connected monkey brain and RCBI across Pacific Ocean. So, Monkey's brain activity was recorded by 200 electrons, and uh, decoding was done, and some essential feature of uh, locomotion was sent to our uh, CBI, and CBI's locomotion was taken by video, and utilizing uh, modern technique, uh, this uh, visual image was seen by a monkey in uh, Duke University. And with this, uh, within a fraction of seconds, 
um, monkey's locomotion and the CBI's locomotion was synchronized. And also we have anecdotal, but very interesting change of uh, monkey brain activity, even after several minutes of connection, right? And I think ultimate system neuroscience uh, should be something like this. So we now uh, have the method to induce neural codes within a specific part of the brain and to see its effect on cognition, learning. But because brain is not an isolated entity, we definitely need to have a human body-like structure and uh, you know, decoded information uh, from the brain should be fed into humanoid robot. And humanoid robot uh, sensor output should be connected to the brain in order to examine uh, minute and uh, secret uh, information processing of the brain. So in a sense, robotics was engineering and computational neuroscience was science. But nowadays, we see more and more complicated relationship between two. Uh, you know, people believe that brain machine interface is an applied field of system neuroscience. It's good for helping you know, stroke patients or blind people or deaf people, but it's far from uh, pure science. That's the you know, common sense for many, many people. But as I mentioned to you, BMI technology, decoding technology, gave us revolutionary technique to uh, implement cause and effect experiments in neuroscience, which was entirely impossible in the past 50 years. Likewise, if we combine uh, robots and uh, brains in a closed loop and uh, manipulate information, extract information in an interesting way, I think it should be really, really exciting in the next uh, 10 years. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, introduce our newest uh, network BMI project, uh, which was just started last year with uh, Professor Shin Ishii, uh, who is a Kyoto University professor, but at the same time, who is a department head of dynamic brain imaging of ATL. So here, uh, we would like to develop non-invasive high accuracy and continuous measurement of brain activities. And the network technology associating brain and environment information uh, is necessary here. And we would like to house and uh, tag brain activity database in daily life should be uh, stored in large scale brain activity database. Data driven brain decoding method should be developed and safety technology for autonomous control of mobile assist devices, as well as exoskeleton and humanoid robots are under development. And safe control of mobile assist devices uh, with distributed sensors have been installed. We built a new house called BMI Smart House within ATL campus. This is a hall view. And this is a monster house with many, many different sensors, many, many different actuators. So G's have all different kinds of actuators. So doors, shutters, and curtains are all actuated and transfer, entrance, attic, robotic bed, and even the height of the kitchen can be moved. And uh, in this collaboration, ATL, NTT, Sexy House, which is the largest uh, house builder in Japan, actually built uh, this house in Shimazu and Keio are included. So with this house, we would like to record for a long, long time, hopefully a few months of a healthy subject family. And we have so many kinds of different sensors in, in this house, so we could uh, label uh, their daily life uh, with method in combination with brain activity. And within this house, not only robotic bed, but also exoskeleton robot, as well as human and robot will be brought in. And uh, we plan our uh, subject family control uh, these uh, robots with their uh, brain activity. So this is the last slide summary. 
and ATL leads a Japanese SLPBS MIC brain machine interface research project that provide new tools for combining system neuroscience and robotics. And flood of brain activity data measured by embedded EcoG or a very portable and wireless new CEG system uh, within BMI Smart House will be shortly available. And we will put all these data on database uh, for everybody in the world. And decoded new feedback could provide an experimental tool investigating cause and effect between neural cause and behaviors. So this may sound, sound like a mad scientist. You control your brain, you control your mind with new technique and uh, induce some changes in cognition behavior or learning. And uh, this may sound very dangerous, but at the same time, this might be the only way to uh, help psychiatric diseases like autistic people or depressive people or schizophrenia or even you know, Alzheimer's diseases. Uh, with this method, you could change special temporal patterns of the brain activity with a powerful decoding and feedback method. That might be a revolutionary cure uh, to these uh, diseases. So please do not say, I should not uh, continue this type of work. And uh, also, I believe that ultimate neuroscience experiment will be examining cause and effect relationship utilizing decoded neural feedback in human robots in a brain, body, robot world loop. Thank you so much for your attention.